Um, ooh, that's a little loud. Um, so like I said, we're going to get started with the talks this afternoon. And our first talk is from Corey Abel. So I'll just hand it over to Corey. Hi. Um, firstly, it's just so great to be here um, in Toronto. I'm from Vancouver uh, at Simon Fraser University. I study in the English department there. So I'm a little out of my wheelhouse, um, which, is, which is really great. Um, so this paper uh, that I'm going to present today originally was titled Regulationism and the Need for a Digital Postmodernism, and it kind of turned into two papers, um, so I think that the, it's not as in the vein of the postmodern tradition anymore, but hopefully you still like it. So the conversation that I want to have today is in regards to the recent calls for regulation of digital content on social media platforms, which comes in the wake of some horrific acts of violence, which have a structural and ideological relationship to the internet. What got me thinking about this uh, in particular is the recent Christchurch shooting, which took place on the 15th of March in Christchurch, New Zealand, where a self-identifying white supremacist attacked two mosques while live streaming one of the attacks onto Facebook. Um, widely reported was the fact that the attacker had a manifesto published online, uh, as well as a history of engagement with alt-right, Islamophobic conspiracy theory groups and forums. This attention to the media behind the attacker is perhaps a common and historical reaction. For myself growing up, this reaction is often came from the chest-thumping conservatives blaming video games and music for turning regular people uh, into killers. Perhaps some of the more famous examples being how gangster rap was seen as instigating violence in the early to mid-1990s, uh, and the connection made between Marilyn Manson, video games, uh, and the shooters at Columbine in 1999. Um, and this is a, a document um, from the Justice Department of the United States calling out NWA. Um, these accusations came from the top with members of state and federal level politics turning to media and censorship as an answer to such acts of violence. And in fact, the current commander-in-chief recently used video games as an excuse of glorifying violence while um, in, a, in a press conference regarding the El Paso shooter. Of course, the difference in media between NWA, Marilyn Manson CDs, and the Web 2.0 is massive, and I am by no means arguing that media does not at times cultivate, inform, and accelerate ideologies. Uh, I think especially the digital has become extremely good at doing so. So my talk today will focus on this moment surrounding these calls for regulation. What I contend is that often such positions highlight a kind of contemporary misunderstanding of the digital, in that it is either a space of control, uh, surveillance and manipulation, or one of intrinsic hope and prosperity. Buried within this dyadic rhetoric echoes the kind of cyber-utopian sensibilities which has dominated discourse around the internet pretty much since it arrived. Sensibilities which have times represented a convergence of social, market, and political idealizations, and I would argue that these, this kind of utopianization, that the World Wide Web is a democratic, free, commercially open space, constructs a contemporary narrative which has become the mainstream take on the internet. So I want to give a more dialectical reading of the digital and this neoliberal rhetoric in light of the role of the internet as a space which argue, arguably contributes to something like the Christchurch shooting. That is, in light of the fact that the digital network as something which contributes to the narrative building of utopian, capitalist, and extremist ideology, it does so only via the robust structures with which contemporary neoliberal systems have firmly entrenched within modern techno communications and media. Therefore, the devices, platforms, and perhaps even the normative claims, which are generally considered to be what is good about the digital, are those same systems which give way to some counter-normative groups. So to begin, I want to frame the recent calls for regulation alongside some, I think, fairly common and fairly intuitive assumptions regarding what the digital is or what it ought to be. Then as a means to pull together what I'm calling a dialectical reading of the digital, I'm going to turn my focus to the notion of enjoyment as it relates to the normative claim of freedom and the role enjoyment plays in cultivating this kind of dyadic A and or B, or A or B, view of the internet 
And I will argue that the inherent injunction to enjoy ourselves as much as possible, which is of course prevalent in consumer culture, combined with some of the structural elements of digital space, create not only the idealized utopians' conceptions of digital space, but perhaps work as a foundation for those less than ideal ideologies appearing within online media. The Christchurch Call Pledge is a three-page document outlining a call to action as well as a commitment between various governments and online service providers to, quote, eliminate terrorist and violent extremist content online. It manifested at the Christchurch Call to Action Summit held in Paris, which was co-chaired by Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand and Emmanuel Macron of France. Various state and technology representatives met and signed the pledge as a direct response to the terrorist attacks which took place in Christchurch. The summit has been hailed as a breakthrough in efforts to limit the voice of extremists online, while also being seen as a move by governments and corporations to control and limit the right to an individual's freedom and sp of speech and mobility on digital platforms. The document itself, which is available online, does appear greatly concerned with balancing this normative standard of free speech alongside its other goals. It reads, quote, a free, open, and secure internet is a powerful tool to promote connectivity, enhance social inclusiveness, and foster economic growth. And then later that, all action on this issue must be consistent with principles of a free, open, and secure internet without compromising human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of expression, um, it must also recognize the internet's ability to act as a force for good, including by promoting innovation and economic development and fostering inclusive societies. So we can see the integrating of open market ideology with these claims of personal freedoms, liberties, and expression packaged in a way in which one kind of sustains the other. The rhetoric of the Christchurch call, sorry, echoes the techno-utopian idealizations popularized in the early 1990s. Specifically, there is an undeniable connection between the call and what's been known as the Californian ideology, which affiliated, as Richard Barbrook identifies, a loose alliance of writers, hackers, capitalists, and artists from the west coast of the United States, from a bizarre fusion of cultural bohemianism of San Francisco with the high-tech industries of Silicon Valley. It arrived in full force after the fall of the Berlin Wall, what's been called the post-1989 situation. Uh, these socio-technical transformation processes, as Clemens Aprich identifies, led to a network-based sociability which became palpable, especially in the global city centers of capitalism. It is the confluence of society entering a new age of technological horizons and connection alongside a changing post-Soviet world which was seeking to reevaluate the social systems of society. What is notable then is the dominant, that, that this dominant cyber utopian ethos still prescribed to the notions of open markets and private investment, an individualism anchored by freedom of expression, which is still evident in our techno-capitalist internet today. And within this utopian ideology was the belief that technology should and rightly would quote, create a new Jeffersonian democracy where all individuals will be able to express themselves freely within cyberspace. There was sentimentalized a notion that the digital was a unique space capable of capturing and proliferating an idealized conception of what an ideal society would be like. And to bring it a little more north of the border, a caller into the, an episode of CBC's afternoon show, Cross Country Checkup, uh, which aired on June 2nd, 2019, entitled, Should Facebook Be Deleted? So this was shortly after the Christchurch Call Summit. This caller exhibited the seemingly paradoxical, yet almost intuitive assumption of, yes, we need to regulate violent content, but we need to uphold freedom of speech, etc., and people should be allowed to post what they want, slash their own opinions, but then we need to regulate fake news. So it is clear the kind of philosophical tension in happening here. There is a conflict of intuitions, freedom of speech versus appropriate censoring, which of course is an extremely complex issue. And interestingly, the platform structure of the digital network confines these issues, and in confining them in such a normative arena, generates a new concern with how such ethical concepts are structured in the specific space, and how the individual is supposed to, or rather ought to, relate to them. 
So basically, with nothing but our words and our expressions online, freedom of speech and freedom of expression takes the cake as the digital normative claim. Now, freedom is awesome. <laughs> However, it is also a bit of a buzzword, and on one which has at times, of course, been mobilized and weaponized. Further, it has pull in that most people would agree freedom is really great, despite it being so difficult to define not only philosophically, but certainly legally as well. Yet, and especially within the Western social psyche, freedom appears to be the ideological moniker. Um, and perhaps there is no better example of this than in contemporary neoliberal thought. As a thread into freedom as a neoliberal notion, I think it's crucial to bring up enjoyment. And if this seems strange, just hear me out a little bit. While not intimately focused on the relevance of the digital network, Todd McGowan's work um, and his approach to the role of enjoyment in late capitalism or global capitalism provides an indispensable insight into the transition from early or liberal capitalism into the late capitalist society, oh sorry, early capitalism, which functioned on the prohibition of enjoyment as a means to instigate production into the late capitalist society of what he calls commanded enjoyment, um, which conversely demands enjoyment from individuals as a means to instigate consumption. So late capitalism emerges, emerges as a shift from the ideological demands of liberal or early capitalism, which relied on this normative pole of a valued work ethic, or at times a service to God, in order to restrict leisure and enjoyment from individuals. This allowed for a dedicated and productive workforce to be mobilized, which was required in the early stages of industrial production. The logic of the system relied on the idea that such a workforce would be collectivized around a kind of mutual submission to the social order and or law, which would maintain production and economic growth. And certainly this was the case in both early Western capitalist societies as well as the emergent societies functioning within a communist framework. Now McGowan's whole position is dependent on the idea that intrinsic to the individual is a kind of wish or desire to enjoy. And this follows from his Freudian thought, which he prescribes to, uh, which offers an account of the superego as the component of a person's psyche, which is constantly striving for enjoyment. I'm not going to bog down this talk with too much psychoanalytic talk, um, but, this is an I but this idea of there being a kind of innate injunction to enjoy is, is important. So the society of prohibition then is an example of this convergence between the superego's aim to maximize enjoyment and the requirements of a community or society to kind of collectivize populace around production. Conversely, the advancement of the society of enjoyment is a reorganizing of this relationship between the superego and society as a means to produ produce a new kind of communal order. Instead, the society of commanded enjoyment is one focused on the illusion of total enjoyment and freedom. And following Paul Barron and Paul Sweezy, McGowan argues how the advent of monopoly capitalism sets in motion the requirement for a class of subjects to be in constant consumption. So essentially, it's the birth of a middle or consumer class. Uh, where we see this political requirement for constant consumption taking over a need uh, to prohibit a class's enjoyment or leisure. So whereas in the society of prohibition, duty was defined by an individual's relinquishing of enjoyment, um, the society of commanded enjoyment encourages the injunction to enjoy yourself. Coke here reaching out to our superego. So what allows for this injunction to enjoy to function so well is that it is a command that appears to be the, cons the consumer's idea, in that they have always really wanted or to desire to fill this intrinsic request to enjoy. The commodifying of the superego's injunction allows for a consumer base to be more effectively sustained. Uh, further, it puts the illusion of power into the consumer themselves, with the individual believing that they are doing whatever it is they want to, this creates a sense of freedom to consume, which ultimately becomes the ideological backbone of neoliberalism. Further, this translates to the digital network, defining the network as, quote, the materialization of democratic ideals in the contemporary information and entertainment networks necessary for globalized neoliberalism. Jody Dean recognizes how essential this sense of freedom is for late capitalism as a commu what she calls communicative, a communicative phenomena. 
Like McGowan, like McGowan, Dean contends that this communicative capitalism, the capitalism of, yeah, that's better. We were getting some feedback there, right? Yeah? Okay, sorry if I'm busting your ears. Um, so Dean contends that this communicative capitalism, the capitalism of distributed, the distributed network, is not about providing individuals with what they need, but is instead concerned about sustaining this ethos of constant desiring and enjoyment. So it is through this freedom to consume complex of neoliberal consciousness where the notion of freedom becomes inextricably connected to digital spaces and their ideologies therein. Referring to it as the defining concept of our epoch, Wendy Chun argues that the network has come to encapsulate everything that is new and different about our social institutions. With the advent of Web 2.0, which provided easy to use tools that enabled millions to publish their own online media, um, the modern digital network, the blogs, the social media platforms, the interactive digital services, and so on, have become the prominent network in which social, political, and economic communicative practices take place. So linking the digital network to neoliberal ideology, Chun argues that networks have been central to this emergence and management of, and imaginary of neo, neoliberalism, and that they follow from this rise of industrial and imperial capitalism. Of course, contemporary networks are often spaces that we enjoy being on. Such spaces are not strictly or explicitly for economic interaction. Um, rather, their fluidity as social spaces and spaces of commodity allow for market ideologies to take full advantage of the individual willingly using the space. So while I'm binging, watching my friends' stories on Instagram of their cute kids and puppies, I suddenly get constant ads for Rambo or something like that, but I go there. And truly the interactive highways of Web 2.0 have proven to be immeasurably beneficial to the flow of capital, labor, and data that market-based ideologies which help to define modern society. How are we doing? We okay? How am I doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. <laughs> so the significance of this neoliberal narrative of freedom becoming a digital phenomena is I think found in the confluence between such narratives and the exceptional perceived distance um, which is intrinsic to digital space. A distance which Slavo Žižek argues involves the promise of, of false opening, the spiritual prospect of casting off our ordinary bodies, turning into a virtual entity which travels from one virtual space to another, as well as a foreclosure of the social power relations. So it is this distance which aids in the manifestation of the utopian imaginary and is one which contributes to the orthodox of limitless freedom required in neoliberal logic. Further, I think this also generates the kind of dyadic picture of the digital, that it is either a space of hope and prosperity or one of control, manipulation, and violence. As Aprich argues that the tendency to utopianize or demonize the internet is deeply rooted in this kind of cultural imagination, namely the assumption that positive or negative social changes can always be derived from technology. The point here being that the digital cannot solely exist exist, sorry, as a space of inherent liberation or manipulation, instead it must be something closer to both, or rather that such dyadic distinctions are just kind of silly. So what I think the important takeaway from this insight is how the same beneficial elements which lead to such utopian assumptions, rapid communication through devices, distance from social constraints, spaces to express anonymously, and so on, are those same elements which facilitates the emergence and cross-pollination of sometimes violent, hateful, and problematic content online. So when governments gather and pick a handful of corporations to meet the goals of a regulated internet, um, we, we should not be surprised that held intact is the ideological ethos which has led to the proliferation of both the neoliberal political and corporate institution. Therefore, the fundamental structure propagating this narrative utopianism and extremism online will go unchanged. And to follow Slavo Žižek, perhaps this is the necessary underside, what he calls, of the internet. That is, perhaps this is just the inherent result of the human community and psyche being engaged in cyberspace. I sympathize with his outlook, but I don't think that means that all regulation is futile or that violence cannot be curbed. To do so, I think we need to reevaluate how the ideological structure of digital space really functions. And if this appears like too much of a daunting and philosophical task, 
to reduce violent outbursts, then maybe some gun resolutions would just do the trick for a bit. Thank you so much.